this button here. It's that button there. And so uh, fluids and pressure. So the main, we've got a few main topics here. And I like to kind of split this into, um, maybe I'll split this into three parts. So you can't teach fluids without understanding pressure. So we're gonna to have to learn some definitions some basic uh, techniques, some basic math, all right? Units, things like that, equations, all right? And then we wanna cover fluids at rest, okay? And so the types of problems that there would be problems that have these are called U-tubes, not the U-tube you know and love, but tubes filled with fluid that are shaped like a U. And maybe there's different types of fluids in these. And the density and pressure will relate to it. Oh yeah, you wanna just pop that all the way open? Sorry, there was so much noise out there, my bad. Just pop that all the way open, sorry about that. Okay. So we'll call these U-tubes. And then there's problems with dams, things like that. But there's also a whole nother class of problems. Or maybe you have an object that's partially or fully submerged in a fluid. Okay, and so there's a force upwards. We're gonna learn about this, it's called the buoyant force. Obviously in this case, there's another force downward, maybe it's mg. And we could have this thing maybe sitting on a table or add some strings, things like that. So there's, this is our fluids at rest problems. And then finally, we're gonna have fluids in motion. Fluids in motion, there's two main problems that come to mind. You can imagine uh, plumbing, right? Basically like this, where you have some sort of pipe, sometimes you might hear it called the main, and there's some fluid flow in this pipe. Maybe it's moving this way with speed V and some diameter, right? And then it ends up coming out here at some other speed, V2. There's a different diameter, diameter two. There's a height difference between these centers. And we could talk about how the shape of the pipe and the elevation of the fluid and various parameters relate to this. There's a couple other classic problems that maybe you've heard of. Imagine you have fluid in a bucket here. Right, and you could run a tube out here and you could fill up another bucket. What's the name for this device that I'm showing here? A siphon, right? And maybe this is sitting up on some lab jacks or something like that. Sorry about that. So maybe we'd want to learn about how a siphon works. And I don't know if you could see the relationship. Sorry about that. Maybe you can see the relationship between these two because there's fluids in motion in both of those. So I maybe this is a waste of time to kind of tell you where we're going, but I like to see the purpose of this. It'll help me understand why we should care about this, right? And so hopefully over the next two lectures, not all in one, we can't, hopefully we'll get through most of this today and this one in the next lecture, or maybe we'll still have a few of these that we have to throw in in the next lecture. Then there's a whole bunch of, I'm gonna call this way cool random topics. All right. And that's gonna be next time. So I know a lot of you like coming on Zoom. There's some stuff that I can't really get the camera to show you. Uh, like.
for example, one of my favorites is, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but like, let's imagine you're making some Kool-Aid or some juice, right? You pour in some powder and you stir it and it all mixes up. Usually you can't unmix it and get the powder back, right? But next time in class, I'll show you a special situation where you can mix something up, then unmix it. Reversible fluid mixing. It's insane. And I can't get it on the Zoom camera. So if you want to see this stuff, and maybe if somebody's feeling brave, I might hit you with a sledgehammer and see if you live for real. All right. So we'll get out the beds and nails and all the cool shit. So if you're, if you're, you should show up next time. Got it? Monday, be here in person. All right. There's some pretty cool demos today as well. All right. Um, any questions about where we're going with this? All right. Let's start with some units and things like that definitions. Come on, there we go. Pressure is really annoying in terms of units, but let's get some basics down. I'm gonna try and use a capital P for pressure. The definition is force over area or F over A. Well, let's get some units down. The standard unit for pressure in a physics class is a Pascal. Most of you have never heard of Pascals. All right. But let's look at these units and see if you can guess what they would be. What is a Pascal if it's a force per unit area? What's a unit of force? Newtons. What's area? Meter squared, excellent. Now we don't usually write out this whole thing, so we're gonna just write it as one PA, okay? So that's just the standard unit, why? Because it works best for physics problems. Now you probably know many other units. Somebody give me another unit that you know. PSI. PSI. Pound per square inch. All right, what's another unit? Somebody that's maybe had chemistry. ATM. Those are some of the more common ones. PSI and ATM. Maybe you've heard of millimeters mercury. Maybe you've heard of tor. Maybe you've heard of bar. Already we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different common units. When you're searching the internet, it's important to know these different units so that you can kind of be like, ah, oh, I don't know what these are, but you can know, oh, that is a unit. I could punch it into Google and convert it, right? Now, I'm gonna give you standard atmospheric pressure here. Give me a second, I'll get out of the way. We're gonna use this term a lot in our class. I'm gonna call it P zero. Unless, and this is given to you on your test equation sheet, I believe, somewhere in here. Yes, it's up near the top. I should probably give you more sig figs, but I'm usually pretty lazy. It's 1.013 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. All right, so that's in chemistry. The reason they use ATMs is because standard atmospheric pressure is defined as one ATM. So that makes a lot of sense too. The problem is if we want to relate these pressures to forces, Pascals is a preferable unit because it's basically we can multiply by an area in meters squared and get newtons for force. Now, perhaps you see the benefit of PSI, pounds per square inch. If you know the area in inches, you can get the force in pounds. And then what is it, 14.7? 14.7 PSI, I think I'm using capital PSI. 
all right? And then these other ones, it's approximately 760 millimeters of mercury, which is approximately equal to 700. I'm going to say approximately. I think it's not exact. And I forget. Okay. And I think this was from Torricelli or whatever, the Italian guy. I don't know. Um, you could read about all these units and where they come from. Um, it says later millimeters of mercury were renamed Tor. And one tor was defined as one 760th of atmospheric pressure. It no longer had to be exactly. So that's why these are only approximately equal, but basically they're very close to equal. All right, to three sig figs, it's probably good. All right. Now, um, if you're wondering where this comes from, there was a dish of mercury. At one point, they just took a dish and filled it up with mercury here. So there's mercury in here, and they had a perfect vacuum. Well, you can't ever have a perfect vacuum. We'll discuss that. But the mercury would rise to a certain height in the column. So that was the original barometer. And this helps us understand where we're going to go conceptually. So I think it's worth talking about this very briefly. Imagine you had some fluid in a dish, right? And then you have a test tube inverted and you put a high vacuum up here, very few air molecules. What makes the mercury rise up? Atmospheric pressure. What's happening is the air molecules are everywhere out here, but there's very few in here, okay? Well, when these molecules, they're constantly moving around, bumping into everything, and obviously there's billions and billions and billions more than I could ever draw. But what happens is each time one of these molecules bumps into the fluid, it is reflected, right? That means the fluid had to exert an upward force on the molecule. That means the molecules had to exert a downwards force on the fluid. That's atmospheric pressure in effect. Now here I'm talking about force, so you'd have to relate that to how many collisions, how often, and the area in which they're happening, but you could convert those collisions and the force that is imparted to a pressure. That's what this number means. Here's another way to think about it. Imagine we're standing here and you lay, you lay down on the ground, right? If you lay down on the ground, your surface area of your body is approximately one meter by one meter. Your whole surface area of your body front and back is about two meters squared-ish. So imagine you're just a square on the ground. There's air up above here, all the way to several hundred kilometers into space. Think about what this unit means. The weight of the air column above this one meter squared is about 10 to the fifth newtons. So this air is an air column that's about 10 to the fifth newtons. Again, if we round this to two sig figs, one times 10 to the fifth, you're gonna hear me say that a lot. It's a, atmospheric pressure is about 10 to the fifth newtons of air weighing down on every one meter squared, got it? So even though this may not seem normal and we've kind of ignored this all semester, I want you to imagine all day today, you're actually swimming around in a giant sea of air. And just like when you swim in a swimming pool, there's a buoyant force up on you. Right now, there's a buoyant force up on us from all this air. It just turns out it's so small we don't notice it. And finally, another weird fact that sticks in my brain, maybe it'll stick in yours. Imagine a refrigerator. The amount of air in a refrigerator weighs about as much as a dozen eggs. Now you wouldn't think so, right? Doesn't that seem kind of crazy? But that amount of air starts to add up. So if you think about an air, or maybe I'll mention this. 
the density of air, obviously it changes day to day, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.29 oh, kilograms per meter cubed. And since we're here, does anybody know the density of water in any units? One, I need a density, so density. That's right. Now notice to convert the centimeters cubed to meters, I'm gonna need 10 to the sixth. To convert the grams to kilograms, I'm gonna need 10 to the third. So it turns out for reference, this is a good trick to know. If you want to go from grams per centimeter to kilograms, you just multiply by a thousand. It's 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. All right. So remember how I said we're swimming around in a sea of air right now? How's my form on breaststroke? Terrible? Yeah, yeah. I used to be on the swim team. I was really terrible. Anyways, um, <laughs> this is what I wanted to point out. Water is about 1,000 times the density of air. Not exactly, but about, right? So the buoyant force from water is about 1,000 times greater than the buoyant force of air. So when you get in a swimming pool, you really notice the buoyant force. We still have that from air, but it's 1,000 times smaller, or maybe what, about 750 times smaller or something like that. Everybody cool with that? So look at this and we see the beginnings of what we're gonna to have to deal with. We need to talk about force, area, pressure, density. All of these concepts are going to relate and there's a big mess of units. So I cannot stress this enough, pay attention to your units in this section of the book. Cool? All right, what else we got? All right, let's look at 14.1 really quick. Susie Smith is doing push-ups, right? And then just to make this easy. Okay, let's say I'm doing push-ups here, right? I'm gonna cheat and just do them right here because I'm lazy. When I'm doing push-ups, man, I hope you guys get this answer quick. And I switch to one arm, Oh, I can't. I'm totally, I got to get better balance. Oh my gosh, I'm going to fall over. This is the question I have for you. When I switch from two hands to one hand, does my weight change? No. no. All right. So will the pressure change? Yes. Why? Because it's more concentrated area. Exactly. If you cut the area in half, there's more pressure. Same thing if you do push-ups on your palms versus on your fingertips. It hurts more, there's less area, the same amount of force, more pressure. Everybody good with that? What's the point of snowshoes? Not that you guys, you do a lot of, does anybody snowshoe here? Just me? All right. Oh, you have, yeah, imagine you put a tennis racket on your foot. The size of your foot gets a lot bigger, you're less likely to push through the snow, and then you're less likely to have to Runs through miles and miles of snow, post holing it, it's called. Or sand tires for bikes on the beach. Exactly. Sand tires for bikes on the beach. Uh, yeah, the, you can see this happening in many different situations. This is why I avoid high heeled shoes. I just don't want the pressure. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Look at 14.2. I think you've got that. Oh, we got Susie Smith and Billy Bob here. Geez, these names are great. Billy Bob stands on a scale with both feet. Bob raises his right foot. Which of the following change? Does the scale, does the force of the scale on Billy's foot change? Okay, he's got two feet there. The scale reads 200. When he raises his right foot, is the scale going to exert more force on his left foot? Yes, right? All the forces on the left foot instead of split evenly. What about the net force of the scale on Billy? Does that change? What does the scale read? It reads the normal force exerted. 
not the weight, right? So now in this case, if you're not accelerating, do you agree the scale and the weight is the same? So as long as A equals zero, yeah, we could use that. But if you're in an elevator, do you agree the scale doesn't accurately read your weight when it's accelerating? Yeah, yeah, okay. So does the net force on Billy change? No, no, it doesn't, right? It's 200 pounds either way. There's more on the left foot, but still got the same. But then the pressure does change. Okay, and then 14.3 is the snowshoes. All right. So I'm going to do a problem with some numbers now. Take a look at 14.4 while I erase the board. Okay. I get it drawn up. Jesus, board's terrible. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> Sending the video clip to the D. So bad. I'll be faster to erase it by weight. Why don't we get a water bottle and just spray it in? I know, we need a fire hose in here. Stat. Awful. Whatever. Good job. You'd probably get another problem or two done every day if I didn't have to raise the board two to three times every single problem. Like something for an engineer. Sounds like something the school should just get done. We told them about it weeks ago. I don't know. They're probably busy. I should be careful. I don't know what they have on their plate. They're probably overworked, understaffed, underpaid, like everybody. Mr. Jorston. Yo. Uh, does this school have an endowment? Yeah. It's not, not that huge. This will get fixed. It will. Probably next semester. This isn't Stanford or Harvard, right? We just, yeah. We'll get it done, but it just takes longer. And... So I know uh, the Ivy Leagues uh, back in 2006. Yeah. They were planning to uh, get free tuition to all of the students. But then the, then the market they, crash. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. That's fine. All right, let's do a problem here with some numbers. All right. So, this is a good one. I know we're kind of going a little slow here, but just trust me, this is a good problem to do slowly. Okay. So, imagine you have a, a roof. Let me just bring this over so I've got some numbers. 14.4. So here's the roof. This problem is going to be a little bit contrived, but let's just make the most of it. So this side of the roof is 10.0 meters. This side of the roof is 15.0 meters. And we're going to ignore common sense and make this roof perfectly flat. So if it rains, there's going to be a giant problem. But pretend for right now there's no angle on this roof. So that it's simple for the, for the math. All right, so the area here is what? Which is, yeah, we'll stick an extra sig fig on there around it here. Uh, is this right? Squared, okay. All right. We're gonna assume somehow this building was sealed when the pressure inside is P zero 
for one ATM. Remember, one ATM is 1.013 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. All right. Now, for some reason, this building was sealed in this manner. Outside, there's a tornado coming. And I looked this up. One of the larger pressure drops I could find any real data. This would be insane, right? You would have to have some serious problem for the pressure to drop 15%, right? If it drops 5%, that might be considered low pressure. We're going to have, and so this could in theory happen where you have this drop. 15%. All right. And then we know the roof has mass 18 metric tons. 18 times 10 to the third kilograms. Approximately 20 regular tons. Okay. All right. Is that right? I'd have to think that through. Because you multiply by 2.2, .2, I think. Okay, whatever. We'll, we'll get that done. We can figure that out later. All right. So now, determine. Okay, so now I'm going to do an FBD. This is the roof. What's one force acting on the roof? Anytime. Gravity, MG. So do you agree that there's an MG down? The outside. The outside air pushing inwards, right? So I'm going to draw it this way this time. There's a force from the outside air. I'll call that force out. How about I call it? Yeah, and a force from the outside air. I don't want you to. Okay, there's a force from the inside air, and that way it's going to be upwards, right? Okay. Anything else exerting a force on the roof? What's that? Yeah, from what? The walls. So there's probably going to be a force from the walls. Which way? You would think there's a normal force up from the walls. So I'm going to call this N over 2. And this N over 2, we're going to assume it's balanced. So that way, N would be the total normal force upwards, right? OK. So let's work this problem out. The force from the outside air will relate to the pressure. We know that pressure is force over area. So what is force? Maybe I'll say that again. I know that pressure equals force over area. So what is force? Uh, no, just this one. Pressure. Yeah, pressure times area. The idea here is, remember, some of these molecules are going to be bouncing off the roof. So if I know the pressure multiplied by the area, that gives me the net force from that bouncing air molecule force. Good? So let's just punch this in. equals what's the pressure of the outside air in pascals nope no. it's 15 for it dropped by 15 percent how much is left got it so i should be saying 85 times that number does that make sense 
And so that's one of the things you got to watch for in the wording, because we get used to just saying, oh, grab 15% of the pressure, but if it drops, yeah, okay, you're good. All right. Multiply by 0.75. What's that? Would you multiply it by 0.75? Then? Oh no! If it dropped 25 percent, then we do 75. Oh, but I mean, yeah. Or okay, yeah, you got it. Okay, yeah, okay, good. All right, and then we got to remember the area is 150. Can somebody punch this in and give me some numbers so we can get out of this problem? I'll grab my calculator too. Is this pace about right or is, I don't know. Let's see how this problem goes before we decide on the pace. EE5 times 150. Woof, that's a big number, isn't it? Well, you have a large, this, this is what's interesting about this. These forces can be huge when the area is huge, right? So that's, I'm gonna mode that into scientific. I don't screw up. I got 1.29 times 10 to the seventh newtons. Anybody else get that? Can I punch it in right? You got that? Okay. All right. Let's get mg. What is this going to equal right here? Let's punch in the numbers for that. 18 ee3 times 9.8. Now we're back to using 9.8. Look at that, the mass of the world. It's not negligible, but it's pretty close to negligible compared to these atmospheric forces. What's the force of the inside air? What's this one equal to? Shouldn't it be exactly the same as this without the 85? Because it's the full pressure. So it's basically just that right here. So I could just take this previous answer and divide by 0.85. I got Everybody okay with that? So we figured out this one up here. What was it? 1.29. Gotta get that next digit. 292. Where is 10 to the fifth? in this number think about this this is one times 10 to the seventh that would be 10 to the sixth that's 10 to the fifth so notice this number makes a difference in the third decimal place what direction is the normal force do you agree this is negligible it's in the third decimal place which force is winning the battle right now? The inside air or the outside air? The inside air is dominating the outside air. What do the walls do if this roof stays in place? They hold the roof down. Isn't that crazy? You know, maybe you guys don't, you guys probably haven't had tornadoes go through your hometown like I did when I was a kid. But right, you hide in the basement and it's kind of scary. It sounds like a train, all this stuff. But the interesting thing is the roof is likely to come off the top and it's going to be blown outwards. So what's the trick? How do you keep your roof from flying off? Open the windows. Why does opening the windows help? Equalizes the pressure. So you open the windows and let some of this pressure will naturally disperse outwards and you'll have a smaller pressure differential. And this was one of the points of this problem. The net force from two bodies of air 
relates to the pressure difference. So a lot of times you could group these things and maybe I'll do it like this. I'm gonna write this up right now. In this problem, uh, I guess this is what I wanted to say here. Two things, one, the normal force does not point upwards. It's actually holding it downwards. So there's some sort of tension, you'd have to bolt it on, right? So that's one factor. Those normal forces are actually going, uh, you could call it something else. We could call it tension over two, where the fasteners are under tension. That's one fact. Number two, if I write this up, I get F, oops. I got F in minus F out. minus mg minus tension equals mass of the roof times acceleration of the roof. If we want the roof to stay in place, we want its acceleration to be zero, but I wanted to look at these two terms, right? You get pressure inside times area. minus pressure outside times the area, minus the weight of the roof should equal the tension in the bolts holding the roof down, okay? So now in this case, ideally you would want this tension to be zero. So you would want these pressures to equilibrate so the weight of the roof itself will hold it down. But look at this cool force that we get here the difference in pressure times the area minus mg is equal to the tension. So what we see is if you have different pressures on either side of a surface, there's a force associated with the pressure difference. Is everybody okay with that? That's what matters when you have these fluid forces, the pressure difference from one side to the other. Just like Torricelli's uh, barometer, right? There was a vacuum up top in the bulb and there was atmospheric pressure outside and that pressure difference from normal atmospheric to almost zero was pushing the liquid up the tube. So far so good on that? This is why we sometimes use gauges. Maybe you've heard of a pressure gauge. Gauges do not read pressure. Even though I just called it a pressure gauge, they read pressure differences. So the convenient part about a pressure gauge is it gives you a pressure difference. You can multiply the gauge pressure by an area. You got yourself a net force from the pressure differential. That make any sense at, at all? Gauges are super convenient because they give you this delta P and so then rather than having to get two terms for a force, you just get the delta P times it by the area, you're on the way. All right. Pressure is just on a scalar, right? What's that? That's right, it's a scalar. I wanna point something out here that I completely ignored. We said this is like a tornado's coming, right? There's wind. We completely ignored the effects of moving fluids. Shh, don't tell. In the real world, this problem is much more complicated, but I wanted just to get this. Is everybody okay that this is not realistic, but it gets the numbers going, kind of gets this main idea that the roof needs to be held down and that there's a force due to a pressure difference. All right. Let's see. All right. Let's go to the next page here. Um, a common question at this point, or a common point, uh, so I'm looking at page 128. I don't want to do problem 14.5, uh, but if you want to, we just discussed that. You could do that at home. There's so much in fluids 
we make so many assumptions. I want to talk about some of them. You've probably heard of compressed air, right? Maybe you've heard of a can of compressed air. Sometimes they sell these little cans of compressed air that you can use to clean a computer keyboard. Or maybe you've heard of an air compressor, right? So air is very compressible. Water is not very, uh, we'll just say not compressible. So my claim is water is not very compressible. And I think I could show you this. We're gonna need a volunteer who's feeling brave. I'm gonna get the demo real quick. Uh, who's feeling? Oh, do we need safeties? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, no pressure. Somebody's got to come up here. Okay, we're going to give you some safeties. This is a hammer. Now, this is just glass with water in it. All right. Now, you'll notice, could you inspect this? Do you see many air bubbles in there or not? No. Now, a couple of things when you're doing this one, we've taken great care, or uh, let's give Angus a round of applause. It takes him like two days to make this. A lot of pressure, man. A lot of pressure. Of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So a couple of things when doing this demonstration. Uh, number one, if it shatters, it shatters. Usually it doesn't, but it might. So maybe I'm gonna get my notes out of the way. I've ruined more than one instructor's notes showing them this cool demo, but so what Angus has done is he's taken great care to put the water in here, boil it, get most of the air bubbles out, top it off with boiled water. Is that about right? Yeah. And so we've gotten almost all the air bubbles out of here. So it's, you can tell there's not many. As a result, the water inside doesn't have much air in it. It's not very compressible. If you remember, we talked about stress strain and modulus a little bit. We say this has a large bulk modulus. It's hard to compress the water. So you need a lot of strain, or a lot of uh, stress to strain. It. So now pick that up, make sure you don't miss. And when you're doing this, make sure the nail isn't going into a knot. Otherwise you'll shatter it for sure. Okay, you might tap it a little to get the feel. There you go, go for it. Do you agree it's pretty, uh, pretty robust? We gave this to like some junior high kids and they went crazy on it for hours. Let's get another one. We got another one somewhere. So what I would do is kind of like gradually ramp up until then you're just going back. Yeah, let me tap it in for you there. All right. So just kind of tap it a couple times and kind of get the, you might want to hold the board like right here. All right, I'll hold it here too. Got it? It's not a very good hit. Do you agree? I love this other hand. Because once you get, so this has its limits, right? But isn't that crazy that this is pretty incompressible? Or the water is so incompressible, it keeps the glass from breaking. Let's give him a round of applause. Let's give Angus a round of applause. All right, there we go. Did that show up on Zoom, Jules? Yeah. Thank goodness. If you guys want to take a hit off that later, we'll let you just, it's pretty cool. The other thing that's cool about it is the lens, right? You can just kind of, yeah, I'll pass it around. You guys can look at it. Looks cool. Look at your paper with it. You'll see it's a cool lens. So my point here is that water is not very compressible. That's the oh whoops, let me get on the right camera. Jeez, what is that? Oh, there, there. They eventually break, but those are a cool hammer. Why am I pointing this out? The whole point of that is to show you that. Density will not change much. 
obviously the density of water will change as you go downwards. But the point of this was to show if the water doesn't compress much, the same amount of mass will take up about the same amount of volume. Obviously it compresses a little bit, but compared to changes in pressure, we're going to assume the density of water is constant. That would not be true for air. You probably know this already. If you hike up a really tall mountain, there's much less atmosphere up there, right? So air is compressible. The density changes with altitude and the pressure changes. And we have to account for both of those factors. But for fluids like water, maybe gasoline, things like that, we're going to assume they're fairly incompressible. And the whole point of that is density, whoops, density doesn't change much. So rho is approximately a constant for incompressible materials. Everybody okay with that? Usually I get the question, wait a minute, shouldn't the density change? We've covered that now. It does change, it's a tiny change, it's negligible compared to pressure differences. All right, so far so good. Out of all that, there's a pressure versus depth equation. Pressure versus depth. I don't like this equation, but it's in every textbook, so I need to talk about it. The reason this problem irritates me with this definition is this symbol right here, H. Normally, when we talk in physics, H has been height for every single freaking problem. And then suddenly, for this one equation, they change H to depth. And let me be clear about what this means. There's going to be some pressure at the surface. Usually, that pressure is atmospheric pressure because right next to it is usually some air molecules, right? But let's say we're in this fluid, and this fluid has some density rho. The idea is, as you go beneath the surface, everywhere on this line, that is some depth, H, has more pressure. And that's effectively because you have more water on top pushing down. Right? What's interesting about this, this is true whether you use a swimming pool or a garden hose. Now, why am I saying that? Imagine, I'm going to put this out here. I'll probably send you a link to this in a minute here or on the break or something. There's an old experiment you could do. You take a barrel. Am I still on, Jules? Yeah. Okay, thanks. So this barrel is sitting on the ground. And then attached to this barrel, you can put a hose fitting. And this, I think, shows why it's so special. Now think about this. If you start filling this up, you start pouring water in here, eventually the barrel is going to fill up and then the hose is going to start filling up, right? Now look at this. At this point, the surface is way up here. So notice the depth when we go down here towards the bottom of the barrel is enormous. What's going to happen to the pressure of the fluid at the bottom here inside the barrel? What happens to the pressure? It gets bigger in a hurry. 
Keep in mind, what is the pressure outside the barrel? What fluid is outside of the barrel? Air, Air right? Now, I just told you that the, the atmospheric pressure of air will change, but only on the scale of several miles usually. So this down here is approximately P0. If there's air molecules in the hose and up here, the pressure at the surface is the same as atmospheric pressure. But because the density of water is a thousand times the density of air, this pressure gets so big, what happens to the barrel? It explodes. But if you try to do this at home, usually something else will fail first, the coupling. You need to make sure you have a really good coupling here, right? Because the pressure could cause the hose to come flying off instead of bursting the barrel, right? And so I've got a video where uh, a teacher did this and they took a giant glass bulb like that one and just exploded it in slow-mo. And I'll, I'll make sure you guys get that in a minute or I'll put it in the comments below the, the video or something. But that's the main idea of this. I wish I knew a good problem to do on this. Damn. That's a joke. Damn physics. <laughs> this is the physics behind a dam. Maybe you thought about this, right? What happens if you have a large body of water here, okay? And you want to hold back that body of water. Maybe you've seen dams that take on this structure like this, where the bottom of the dam has more concrete than the top of the dam. Well, does this make sense from a pressure perspective? Now, here's something weird that you might not expect. At this point, the water has the same pressure up, down, left, right, diagonal, etc. So what's happening here is if you have atmospheric pressure at the surface, the pressure is going to increase linearly as you go downwards. And so the pressure at the bottom of the dam is significantly larger. And obviously there's static equilibrium concerns. You don't want this to tip over. But it makes sense probably logically that if the force goes up as you go down, you probably need a wide base to keep this thing from tipping over. So there's a dam problem. I think it's 14.8, and we can talk about that in a minute. Okay, um, again, one last time, this is only gonna make sense if the density is constant. So you're not gonna use this for what fluid? If I need the density to be constant, we probably shouldn't be using this equation for air, air. okay? Because air can be compressed and then the density is not constant, okay? All right, let's try 14.7. I'm gonna erase the board. You guys take a look at it. If you get done with that one, you can try 14.8. And after those, we'll take a break. So I'm just erasing on Zoom, all right? Fluids are wild. If I'm still racing. Have you guys started to get used to the, the workbook or not? I'm just curious. I feel like it comes in handy at these moments where I'm erasing and there's right, you're just sitting there. Do you like that how you can kind of read the problem and get ready for it, or do you not care or any thoughts on that at all? Anyone? Oh, you just chill? Yeah. All right. I got you. All right. So the pressure that one object is on the other is the same. Yeah. Yeah. Totally true. 
I should mention here too, this was the, this was probably the hardest chapter for me to write. It's very difficult to teach people about fluids, full stop. There are so many subtleties in it. Man, I, I have to be very careful to say things correctly and not be lying to you. In general, I, I truly believe like this is this is only good as an introduction. And we're learning some like never, never trust anything in fluids until you've taken a real fluids class. It's just I've seen I've seen publishers, right, from reputable textbooks screwing up the physics. And they do these demonstrations and they just they're just wrong. And you're like, oh, that's cringeworthy. So you got you really got to be careful reading the internet on fluids, okay? Um, if you really, I can send you to some good resources, or like I said, take some engineering courses before you think you know anything. You're learning the units, the basics, and I'll try not to steer you wrong. All right, super difficult to learn this stuff. All right. 14.7. Let's do this quickly. Okay, we've got some fluids here. And maybe what I'll do to get through it quickly, I'm only going to do the final state, okay? I'm going to jump right to the final state because I think we've talked about this enough. We have two fluids on top of each other. And then to label these, I think it makes sense. Let me read here. So a glass of water is eight centimeters tall. So we have 8.00 centimeters of water. And then up top, what do we have? Oil. We have 12.0 centimeters of oil. Somebody remind me, what was the density of water? One gram per centimeter cubed. By chance, do you remember the conversion factor I told you? If we want to go to kilograms per meter cubed. Do you remember that conversion? Times by a uh, thousand i'll give it to you just trust me okay you can do the railroad tracks do you agree what's the density of this oil in this problem does it say it says 20 percent less dense than water what's its density then 0. 0.80 times a thousand, which is 800. I can't help it, I'm a physicist. I like kilograms and meters rather than grams and centimeters. You know what I'm saying? So let's default to that. Okay, we can always come back. Do you agree this would be 0.8 grams per centimeter cubed if we needed it? I'll put that up here just in case. Kind of be lazy with six figs, all right. And now I'm going to assume there's air up here. I'm assuming we're not doing this in a vacuum. Unless we are told otherwise, what pressure should we assume the air has? Unless told otherwise, we're going to assume what is the pressure air? Any units? One ATF. Okay. So, unless you're told otherwise, we assume pressure is one ATF. But these are horrible units for a physicist. So, then we get our 10 to the fifth. 
And remember, one Pascal is one Newton per meter squared. I want to label this. Right here, there's air. What's the pressure then? If I have air there, P0. What's that? Oh, yeah, that would be the force. Yep. So if we knew the areas, you're right. Yeah. I want to go back to what he was saying. Didn't you just say that the pressure that one exerts on two is the same as the pressure that two exerts on one? Now, if this surface is not going up and down, these must be in equilibrium. Those forces must balance. So do you agree the pressure at the surface right here? must also be P naught. Okay with that? So then down here, let's call this pressure one. What must be the pressure at the water surface then? If this interface isn't moving around, what has to be the pressure at the water surface? P one. And then we could come down here to the bottom and call this P2. So my question is, I want to know the pressure on the bottom of here. That's it. So let's not overthink it. P1 should equal the pressure at the oil surface plus density of the oil times G times depth of the oil. I know that pressure two should equal pressure at the water surface plus the density of water, G times H of the water. I probably should have been consistent here. Maybe I'll call this water here instead of H2O. Okay, sorry about that. Do you notice anything that we're going to have trouble with when we start punching in numbers here? Sig figs. Nah, yeah, you're right, but we're going to ignore sig figs. Let's assume everything has infinite. What else? Units. Yeah, what are the units that we should probably change out? G. What would you change G to? Yeah, I don't agree. What are the depths? The depths. And the, the issue is our pressures we know in Newtons, which has kilograms and meters in it. So that's why we want to do everything kilograms and meters. The H's are the only things. So remember, the height of the water is not eight. What should I use for it? I, I should be careful. The depth of the water, excuse me, the depth. Ignoring sig figs. And the depth of the oil should be, got it? And do you agree, the whole point here is we could just kind of daisy chain these together. So notice P2 is equal to, whoops, I should have used black for that one, sorry. Ah, whatever. Going to be going to be P naught. That's the atmospheric plus density of the oil, G H of the oil plus density of the water, G H of the water. So far, so good. So. The reason I did this was so you could see that, yes, this is consistent. If you have multiple columns stacked on top of each other, that's cool. And notice the area doesn't matter. In general, that's true unless the area gets so skinny, you get capillary effects. Maybe you've noticed like a really skinny straw, water will draw up a little bit or something. We're, we're ignoring that. So we're assuming the area of the, the vessel is fairly large. 
Let's get you to your break. One more problem. Let's get that damn problem done. 14.8. You've got the solutions to that one. You can look them up, okay? We have a dam. No water in it. Oh. It's even clapping in 10 years, I guess, right? We're all going to be dry as a bone. So let's keep this problem simple. In this problem, let's assume the dam is a simple rectangular slab, just so we don't have to think. We've got some water being held back by the dam. And I think in the picture, the water level goes all the way up to the top pretty much. So let's do that. So let's say the dam is full, wishful thinking. We're told that this dimension here is H. This dimension here is the thickness. And there's actually a top view, which shows the dimension into the page. So if I drew a top view, here's a top view of the dam. There's the lake. What I'm saying is this dimension is T. And this dimension here is D. Everybody cool with that? It's a rectangular slab with dimensions D long, T thick, and H tall. Make sure this is labeled well. This is the top view. This is the side view. So to be clear, we know which view is which. All right. We've already discussed this. What's the pressure of the air up above? What is our normal assumption? One ATM or P naught. So you know, as you go deeper underwater, the pressure should increase. And that's the pressure in every direction. All right, and let's see where I want to go with this one. Determine the pressure at the bottom. The pressure at the bottom should equal the pressure at the surface plus density of the water, because that's the fluid here, times G times H, the depth of the dam. Okay. What is the average? pressure. I know the pressure at the top is P0. I know the pressure at the bottom is this. What's the average pressure? It varies linearly. How could you get the average here? What's that? You could do an integral. There's an easier way when it's a linear function. Let me, let me show you a random linear function here, right? Yeah, if this goes from zero up to 10 and it's a straight line, what's the average going to be for this linear function? Right in the middle, right? Because do you agree the integral is the right way to do it in general, but that's the area which is going to be half of 10, basically. You know what I'm saying? And there's the width and whatever. But yeah, so if you have a linear function, you could just take the midpoint as the average. Anytime it's nonlinear, you have to do what you say. Cool. So when I add them together, I get 2p naught plus this. Then I divide by 2. The 2 drops out on this term, but then that comes in. So it's going to be p naught Is everybody okay that that's going to be the average, right? Starts out at p naught You add this much at the bottom. So in the middle, it's going to be the average because it's a linear function. All right?
Okay, here's the ground over here. What's the pressure on this side of the dam? Air pressure. Air pressure. So we have P naught over here. What's the average delta P? What's the pressure difference between one side of the dam to the other on average? What's the average change in pressure? What's the difference between here and the average pressure? This, the P knots are gonna cancel out, do you agree? Am I losing you here? How about I just draw it? How about I draw it? Do you agree it would be P naught plus rho water GH over two minus the pressure on the other side, which is just the P naught. Sorry, I, that's what I was trying to say. You have to worry about ah, like which side's which? Yeah. Like okay, this is a good question. I would say it like this. We know that there's a force associated with the delta P. Does it go from high pressure to low or low to high? High to low. So you're always going to get a force. We know the direction is from high pressure to low, right? The water is going to tend to push the dam outwards and explode it, right? So we're like, you know, the pressure is higher. Yeah, well, what, what I'm showing you here is you could just get both the pressures, figure out the pressure differential, and know that the force goes from the high pressure region to low pressure. So now get the delta P, and we know that there's a force this way. Got it? So notice in this case, the pressure differential is just this term, density of the water, G, H over two. What is the force that the water is exerting on the dam? And that would be, is pressure average times the area. What's the area? D times H. D times H. Not the, the thickness doesn't matter, agree? In the sense of the thickness does not relate to the amount of force. Obviously, the thickness matters in the sense that you need to make the thickness big enough that it can hold back this force. So what was it, HD? Now, keep in mind, the dam does not need to exert this amount of force. It only needs to balance the force associated with the delta P. So if I need to figure out how much force the dam actually needs to support, I don't have to support all that P naught HD. Right? I only need to do, oh wait, wasn't there a two? Did I forget a two here? If we're looking at the average force on the dam, I need to use the average pressure. I apologize. So notice the force that the dam needs to exert is only related to this delta P pressure, which is going to be rho G H over two times HD, or notice it's rho G D over two height squared. Do you see that? Notice there's a squared in there. Now, I don't know, I'm not a dam engineer, but maybe, maybe that has something to do with that curved shape. Again, there's much more going on in a dam than just this. You have to worry about not only keeping this thing from sliding, you have to keep it from tipping. And there's, yeah, so there's much more that goes into a dam than what I know. But I do find it interesting that the force exerted scales as the height, or excuse me, the depth squared. So far, so good. And I know you want to take your break. I want you to look at 14.9 really quick. I'll draw it up. It's over. 
then we'll take a break, I swear, I promise. Okay. 14.9, we have two lakes. We have two dams that are equal size. And one of them is holding back. And these are both top views, okay? One of them is holding back a long skinny lake. One of them is holding back this wide lake. Much more water in it. Okay, you have two dams. The actual dams are the same dimensions. So the dams have the same size. The only difference is the amount of water they're holding. One of them is holding back the water in a narrow channel, and you can assume these lakes are of equal depth. So water equal depth. Which dam has more force on it? What do you think? It's the same. What matters? The density of the fluid, G, and the size of the dam, not the size of the lake. So let's, if, right? Wouldn't you think? I would think that too, right? You think a bigger lake, it takes, no. So this is what matters when you're placing a dam somewhere. You want to make sure you have something that narrows down really skinny and then goes hella wide behind it immediately. So you can store the most water with the minimal amount of concrete. But isn't that crazy? And so, yeah, okay, that's now let's take our break. I thought that was slightly interesting. Um, cool, right? Yeah, all right, take a break. Yep. So I'm assuming that no matter what is the water depth. Yeah. H squared matters the most in this equation. So, right, if you can have, and now the width of the dam matters too. So where do most of these dams get built? Canyons with a large floodplain behind it, right? Lake Mead, Lake Powell, Lake Mojave, Lake Kachuma, Lake Edison, Lake Florence. Okay, yeah, they're everywhere, yeah. But what if water is, is uh, directed to small enough space, shouldn't that increase the pressure of put on that small? Now keep in mind, we're assuming this water is not flowing here, okay, so right? It's a river. If, we, if we're talking about a river, that might change things. And we could discuss that probably next class when we talk about fluids in motion. Now, to be fair, all of these dams almost always will have some holes right here with turnstiles in them so that you can have the water flow past a turbine. Yeah. That turbine is then going to spin some magnets. Those magnets are gonna be you know, coils of wire those coils of wire, ah! Wait, that's physics 163. We'll cover that next. But yeah, so there are gonna be portions where the water's flowing and different physics applies there. And if I may ask, how does pumping water work? Because I know that the, the water in one tank space is kind of useful. If, if it how do go... pumps work is basically what you're asking, right? Yes. There's many types of pumps and the physics involved of them are different and where you place a pump matters a lot. So you could place a pump at the top of the Grand Canyon or at the bottom of the Grand Canyon and the physics involved will be different. Yeah. Keep in mind, there's issue, well, remember what Torricelli was showing us with this, um, Torricelli, I don't know how to say it, but um, that, I'll tell you what, let's stop and I'll talk to you because I'm babbling here, cool? I want to get to the break and I'll answer your question. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's take that break. Go to Cherry.
All right, let's just, let's go this way. Okay. The auto focus, there it goes. Okay. So right here, let's get back into it. Uh, this is an interesting thing. Right now, we've basically been dealing with rectangular volumes of liquid up until now, right? And so I'm curious what's going to happen if we use something that's not rectangular, like this funky tube here. And I don't know if you can see that at all. Is that showing up on Zoom, Jules? Yeah. Okay. So the idea is I'm going to put some fluid in here, and we're looking at problem 14.11. 14 14.11. 14 right. And so when I put this water in here, maybe you guys could just watch for a second and watch as I fill this up. All right. You see, there's a little bit of oscillation for a brief minute when the tube was getting filled. Did you see it kind of slosh a bit? And then it stabilizes. And now I didn't think this through. The blue water with the blue background, you probably can't see it at all. Let's just go over here and look at this thing. Give me a second on Zoom. All right, so here it is. You can see this fluid again. And now, the reason I'm, and you can see if I just move it a little bit, sometimes you see a slosh a little bit and then it stabilizes. So fairly quickly, this thing stabilizes. You know this from water. There's an old saying in fluids. We say water seeks its own level. Now the idea here is this. If you could imagine this section of the tube right here and imagine the fluid in this section of the tube. The idea is we know it's not moving. So the pressures must be the same on either side. If they weren't the same, the forces would be different. It would accelerate. Is everybody okay with it? So I need the force to be the same on either side. That means I need the pressure to be the same on either side. As a result, regardless of the shape of the tube, it's only the depth of the fluid that matters. We need all these tubes to have the same depth. Otherwise, the pressure would be different and the forces would be different and it would slosh because it's not. Is everybody cool with that? The way physicists and fluid people remember this is you say, fluid water seeks its own level. So obviously, you could imagine this is important in a flood situation, right? So if you have a large floodplain like Santa Maria and the dam, remember, uh, maybe was anyone around when Twitchell Reservoir flooded many years ago? Maybe that was, yeah. Anyways, this happened here where the dam broke and there's a, a, I think they were able to fix it and it wasn't catastrophic or anything, but you can look that up, uh, Twitchell Reservoir uh, flood. I don't remember the year. Anyways, um, that was a ways back. But yeah, obviously, if you have water get over a seawall in a major town, then all of that water is going to come up to that same level, regardless of what structures you try to build there. It's just going to flood everything. So, um, yeah, that's, that's my brief discussion of this statement. Earlier, I told you there was a cool video you could watch. Look at the bottom of page 130. Pascal's blazing barrel. Okay, a cool related demo can be found doing a web search for inverted Pascal experiment. So basically, there's the keywords you need to search if you're looking for those videos that I was talking about. Now, um also 14.10 is one of my favorites i'm gonna let you read that one at home so put a star next to 14.10 and do that one at home finally we're up to one of the main principles that i, I think fluids are are special okay so let's talk about this most of you probably got here in a vehicle some of you probably took a bike which is cool or walked which is awesome but a lot of us had to either come to school on a bus, a car, or some, some vehicle of some kind. Oh, yeah, I, I take my chopper in usually. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, think about this. What do you physically do with your body to stop a car? 
How do you, as a human being, stop a car? You push with your toes lightly. Isn't that crazy? You could take an object that weighs a ton, moving 80 miles an hour, I mean 55, no one speaks, and stop it with your toe. Obviously, you know there's some physics involved in this, right? Hydraulics. But let's just start with the simple concept of how hydraulics work. And this is problem 14.12. This is a very simplified version of hydraulics, okay? We're not getting into the real life issues, but just the basic physics principles. Imagine you have a piston here. And over here, you have a much larger piston. Okay? And we're going to keep things simple. In this problem, oh, Esmeralda is doing the work here. She's on a piston with diameter 20 centimeters. So this one has a diameter of 20.0 centimeters. And I think this one over here has a diameter of, let's use big D for that. What was it, 63.2? What did I say? 63.2. Okay. And so I'm gonna call this one little d for small diameter and that one big D, sort of like we use little m and big M in the gravitational chapter. Well, this happens a lot in fluids where you have a small diameter with lowercase d, a big diameter with uppercase d, all right? Now, under this, I'm going to put some fluid. Okay. So inside of there, we supposedly have some fluid. Keeping this simple. What must be true, and let's say this is an equilibrium, okay? All right, it's not, not accelerating. And to be clear, I think on this one, Esme was standing. And on this one, there was a large block of depleted uranium, okay? So this one had some uranium sitting on it for no good reason, it's uranium just to keep it spicy. All right? So we've got this, and I want to check one last piece of information. Okay, the masses of the actual pistons. We're going to assume that compared to Esme and the uranium, the mass of the piston is negligible. So the mass of the actual piece of metal that she's standing on is negligible. What was Esme's mass, did it say? 45 kilograms. So Esme is 45 kilograms there. And the mass of this piston is also negligible, okay? That's our setup. Now, Imagine this chunk of water right here. What has to be true about the forces on either side? If it's in equilibrium, what has to be true about those two forces? The same. So what has to be true about the pressure at these two points? What's true about the pressure here and the pressure there? They're the same. Even though they have different weights on top of them, right? The heights or the depths determine the pressure. Okay, so that means what's true about the pressure right here and right here? Same pressure, same depth. So if you have the same depth, you must have the same pressure. So do you agree Mg of Esme I'll just say Mg of Esme divided by the area of Esme's piston 
must equal the mass of the uranium times G over the area of the uranium piston. Take a second. Do you believe that? If the pressures are equal, right, pressure of ESNI should be pressure of the uranium side. But that's force over area on each side. Is everybody okay with that? Good. Well, the mass of ESNI, well, let's rewrite this. What's the mass of uranium you could support with 45 kilogram ESNI? If we solve for the mass of uranium, that should be ESNI's mass times the area of the uranium piston over the area of ESNI's piston What's the equation for the area in terms of its diameter? Somebody help me out. What's the area involved? Pi d squared over four. Uranium has the big diameter. Notice what drops out. A lot of these constants. So it's not just the diameter, it's the diameter squared. You could take the ratio of the diameters and square it. Notice the units are going to drop out. So we can plug this in. 45 kilograms times the big diameter was what? 63.2 centimeters. The small diameter was 20, I think. Notice I didn't have to convert in this one instance because I take the ratio and the units drop. That's why I didn't convert to meters in this one case. Let's figure it out. Punch it in. Okay, 45, whoops. 45 times 63.2 did 20 quantity squared. Whoa. 449. So notice the ratio is about 3.33, right? Or 3.31, uh, something like that. So the whole point is this is the ratio you need to get 10 times the force. As me, a little kid. It's 45 kilograms, 100 pounds or so, can hold up this giant one ton chunk of uranium as long as the diameters are just a factor of three different or so. A little over three. Crazy, right? Now, look at the next problem. What if we did this to it? Gotta make sure I draw this right. Let's say we put a pivot point right here, put this right here, put the piston and attach it to this pivot point. Now think about this. You could apply a downwards force here with your hand. And now you're using a lever arm to multiply the force that gets exerted. And then you could use this force from your hand to push down and lift an entire vehicle up in the air just by doing this, right? That's the principle behind a bottle jack or a hydraulic jack. Now, I know this is gonna seem silly, but I've got the world's worst hydraulic system here. Thanks, 
I know it seems cheesy, but here's the world's cheesiest hydraulic system, right? Now, I don't know if you can see this at all. Uh, let's go over here. Seven. Whoops, no, eight. Sorry, I'm starting to get tired. Let's zoom way in. You let me know if this shows up at all on Zoom. Can I see that at all? Yeah. Okay. So the idea here is here's a simple version of a hydraulic jack, right? So you have one piston that's bigger than the other one. Can you see that at all, too? Sorry, this is getting weird. I like things you have to do to get this off camera. Right? But so the idea here is you don't get something for free. If you actually want to lift the vehicle instead of just hold it stationary, Notice something about the volumes of fluids when I'm pushing on this. Notice how far the little syringe has to be pushed in order to make the big syringe go up. In particular, notice in this case, if I raise this thing approximately a thumb's width, this entire piston needs to be depressed. This is kind of like the equivalent of your force distance trade off. Remember, we talked about that. The work done is force times distance. And so, yeah, you don't get, you like when we did the block and tackle and things like that, it's somewhat similar to that. Anyways, I hope that kind of is cool. So if you want, I think, did I do this somewhere? If you look on the top of page 132, problem 14.14, .14, so if you're looking at problem 14.14, .14, this is the visual for that. The idea being, if you have twice the diameter, that's going to be four times the volume. And so you have to push four times as much fluid. And so if you're wanting to sketch that in, you can right now, that's cool. We're getting close. We're, we're still good. Gosh. And then let me see if I could find this really quick. Zoom, I haven't forgotten about you. Just give me a second. I think it's this one. Yes. I'm going to turn on the. Uh, give me a second. I'm just putting the simulation up. Gosh, it's crazy. My brain is going crazy up here. I think you might find this slightly interesting. Still working, Zoom. I haven't forgotten you. That's as much as we can get. Let's go full screen. Can we do that? There we go. All right. So hopefully you can see this. We were talking about how hydraulics might matter, and the reality of it, the reality of it is a little bit more complicated than what we were showing earlier. But I think you can kind of get the idea here. Obviously, your foot has to push on something, right? So your foot is going to push right here. So there's where your foot interacts with the system. Notice you've got this complicated uh, piston looking thing here, but it's basically a piston, sort of like what we were just showing with the syringes, right? So you're able to drive the piston forwards with your foot. The return spring right here, whoops, that's just to allow the pedal to respond backwards. And notice there are these inlets and outlets. And so as you push the cylinder, you need to have the brake fluid actually enter there. But then we see that you can get an amplifier when you go all the way down through the tubing, right? So you're increasing the pressure here. And then as a result, you get this force multiplier associated with the hydraulic system. And so those, yeah, those pistons are going to basically exert the force of friction as the discs are spinning all right i think that's enough on that i don't know i thought you might find that slightly interesting i feel like you could understand the basic physics of this now 
the actual mechanical engineering of it is beyond me. I, I've never fixed my own brakes, but the main concept here, I think, is somewhat interesting. Go ahead. I was going to ask, uh, what kind of fluid is the brakes? Brake fluid. <laughs> I have no clue. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, and maybe somebody knows, maybe it's important to have a very incompressible fluid. Maybe it's something that doesn't take, maybe it's something that's got uh, good thermal properties. There's a lot going on in brakes, right? When they rub, there's friction. When there's friction, there's going to be heating. Maybe, I, I just don't know anything about it and why they chose the fluid. So there you can take an automotive course or read online. It needs to not boil. What's that? It needs to not boil. Yeah, and so I, I don't know if you've ever had your brakes go out when you're driving down a mountain. I have. It's pretty freaking scary. And so what happens is if you get too much heat, it'll just boil off. And so I was 40 miles from the nearest road too. It was a long day. I had to walk and find somebody to hitchhike. To, oh man, it was bad. And then it turns out we finally got a tow truck. He's like, oh, your brakes probably work now. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, because it's had time to recondense. So the brake fluid will boil off. And then if you just stop for a while. So if you notice your brakes getting soft on a mountain road, you should stop immediately. Uh, you know, like I actually used the emergency brake to stop my vehicle. I was, oh man, it was scary. We probably could have all died had something not gone. You might have had a much easier physics class then too. <laughs> oh well. Yeah, yeah, so I don't know. Crazy story. I'm still here. Anyways, yeah, that car was a trooper. All right. Um, I also had two flat tires at the same time, and a cooling fan went out. That was the death of that vehicle, that one road. Two flat tires, brakes burned out, and the cooling fan went out, all in like one five-mile stretch of road. It was destiny. Ah, okay. Uh, enough on that. Crazy adventures. All right, so uh, that's kind of cool. Great. Um, let me mention something else here. We're kind of covering a few weird little loose ends. Fluids is filled with stuff like that. Uh, let's go this one. Come on. Let's get these off. I don't know. Hopefully you guys find this slightly interesting. And I promise on the uh, last day of class, I'll clarify what is expected of you regarding fluids on the final exam. Got that? So I promise probably after at the end of next lecture, I'll be like, okay, this is what you really got to know. For now, let's just learn and explore, okay? Lights, okay. Oh. Very practical fluids. A lot of cool stuff you can do with it. Very complicated too. All right, so we've talked a little bit about hydraulics. I mentioned this earlier, but you may want to look at the bottom of page 132. I want to talk about absolute pressure and gauge pressure. If you have to take a chemistry course at any time, this is crucial. This comes up in chemistry all the time, physics as well. So let's say you have a tire sitting on the ground. There's a valve. Okay, that's the tire valve. And you're going to put a gauge on this puppy. Okay. There's the gauge. Maybe you've seen it. There's like these little stick gauges. There's various types of gauges. So there's a gauge. If you're reading the tire pressure, either on a bicycle or on a, on a car tire, maybe let's start with car tires. Does anybody know a typical normal sedan tire pressure that is used? 35 PSI is the typical. That is not the air pressure in the tire. That's the pressure that the gauge reads. So I'm gonna call that gauge pressure. And I don't know why, gauge pressure is always a word I misspell. Now we switch to A and the U, that's just me. I don't know why, so I gotta look it up. Pressure of the gauge. Now remember, this is the pressure difference between in 
and out. So a gauge is not reading the absolute pressure. Does anybody remember typical air pressure? What is air pressure in PSI? Approximately. 14.7, can we round that to 15? I'm going to. So it's easier to remember 15 PSI, all right? So now the trick is the gauge reads 35. What is the actual pressure in here then? Pressure absolute is equal to 50. It's right, the gauge is reading the difference between these two. The difference between 50 and 15 is 35. Got it? Why am I mentioning this? If you are doing a problem in chemistry and you're doing PV equals NRT, of course you're going to use capital R because physics is cooler than chemistry with their little r. <laughs> but yeah, the idea here is the pressure that you use in this chemistry equation needs to be absolute pressure, not gauge pressure. So the most common mistake students make in chemistry is they'll read the gauge pressure and plug that into PV equals NRT and not account for the extra atmosphere pressure associated with reading the gauge. Does that make sense? How does a vacuum gauge work? So maybe you're gonna work with vacuum systems someday. Well, imagine you've got a bell jar like this and there's a gauge on it. That gauge is reading the difference in pressure between the inside and outside. It's effectively the same thing. It's always gonna read larger minus smaller. So in a vacuum gauge, you're reading outside pressure minus inside. In a tire gauge, you're reading inside pressure versus outside, but it's again, a pressure difference. And how that works will affect how you design the mechanism for the gauge, but whatever. Is everybody cool with gauge pressure? Absolute pressure and gauge pressure are different. Gauges record pressure differences. Enough on that. There's a cool demo I thought that would be neat. Look at that on page 133, I haven't done that. Just imagine taking a cup and putting a pressure gauge on it and just shoving it under the water and maybe having a long stick. I think that would be cool. I haven't done it yet. We'll do that maybe sometime. I'll, I'll, see, I'll see what we can do. We got five minutes. I'm going to foreshadow next lecture so you can read ahead if you want. I'm going to go over here to this thing and just look at it. We're going to talk about buoyant force. Um, maybe I'll write it up on the board first. So I'm looking at the top of page 135 really quick. The buoyant force, the force that helps things float will depend on three things. It depends on rho f. What do you think that means? Rho f. What is rho? Density. What do you think f means? Fluid. So you could have air, you could have water. It's whatever fluid you're using. So whatever you're floating in. So that's the density of the fluid that you're floating in. V D I S P. Some people just call that V subscript D. That's volume displaced. That's the amount of fluid displaced. More on that in a minute. G, that's our standard G. That's 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, I think I could, again, we're going to talk about this next time. I want to show you the most important subtleties on this with a demonstration really quick, and we'll pick it up there next time. So give me a second. Let me get the camera on here. What is it? Eight? Eight. Okay. Let's zoom in on this crap. All right. 
Nothing up my sleeve here. That's water. Okay. Just dyed it blue just so it looks cool. And I forgot about blue. Right. Now, in this case, I'll throw some wood in here. Watch the water level. Okay. Watch the water level carefully. Did you see it move up a little bit? Maybe we put some more wood in there. I want to come up here for a second. Can you put your finger next to the water level for me? Just go stand on the other side behind that green stick. I just point at the water level. Got it? Is that showing up, Jules? Yeah. Okay. Do you agree now you can see it a little bit better? So this is the depth that was displaced. You could multiply that by the area to get the volume displaced. You can literally calculate the volume it displaces, right? Now, do you agree if we did this in the ocean, we would not be able to get that depth? So that's why this is a little bit tricky. Now, I want you to answer me this. Is the volume displaced equal to the volume of wood? What do you think? Yes or no? No. Look at this. Do you agree that not all of the wood is underwater? So for objects that are partially submerged, the volume displaced is not the volume of the object itself. It's some fraction of the volume that relates to its density. Maybe you've heard that 90% of an iceberg is underwater. It's because the density of ice is 90% of the density of water. Alcohol has a density of 0.8 grams per centimeter cubed. So if you go to the club and your ice cubes sink, you're in for a long night. Anyways, let's, let's do one more. Okay, uh, stay there. I remember there was one block in there at first. Now I'm going to take this out so you may have to readjust your finger. Okay, let's let that stabilize for a minute. That's starting to get somewhat stable here. Let me put my hand in here. Just kind of add some more banding. Whatever. Just kind of eyeball it, okay? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this big chunk of iron. Go ahead and mark the side the best you can. In this case, we still see there's a little bit of displacement. But in this case, the object is almost completely submerged. Do you agree? So for an object that sinks, usually the volume displaced does equal the volume of the object. For an object that's floating up on top, it's some fraction of it. However, this is not the whole story either. Okay, we're gonna have to pour some more water in here. We've got a little boat here. How do most boats work? Right now, this boat is displaced in a negligible amount of water, right? Look at it. Watch the water level, I'll let it stabilize. It's a tiny displacement, it's there. But how do most boats work? They're freaking hollow. So now when I put this in here, it's a cargo ship, right? Just barely floating, right? Notice the volume is not the volume of the iron that's being suspended. It's not the full volume of the boat. It's some fraction of the volume of the, of the boat. If you ever hear about naval vessels, they're always talking about their volume displacement. How many cubic meters of volume? Do, that's why this stuff matters. The volume the boat can displace determines the total amount of craft you can have on the boat. If you know how much volume you can displace, you know how much buoyant force you can get, and that's how much mg you can support, assuming there's no waves and wind. Is that where Bernoulli comes in? Bernoulli is fluids in motion, and we'll talk about that at the end of next time. So, yeah, all right, let's give him a round of applause here.
get to this next time. That's it for today. So if you want to read up on this, go ahead. Buoyant force and fluids in motion next time. Woo. And the force of like the buoyant force is like in our average direction or what's that? Like the direction of the force. The buoyant force is going to be upwards. Just upwards. And we'll talk about that next time. Yeah.